Namaste. So I want to continue the topic from yesterday's video because there were a few points I made when I reviewed the video I felt could be misunderstood. And so I want to present the other side of the argument <laughs> for a balanced view. The point was that the actual truth, the existence, Brahman, whatever you want to call it, is ineffable, inexplicable, inconceivable, non-conceptual, okay? And therefore, the structures that we build up around it, philosophies, religions, spiritual practices, even language itself, are all abstractions. The map is not the territory. The words are not the things they represent. Now, of course, I'm not the only one who's made this point. Many people have, and many teachers have. But what tends to happen, and the danger in making this point, is that one can go on and take it to an extreme, which is a tendency of the human mind, and fall into the trap of nihilism or nihilism. Nihilism means that the actual truth is ineffable, therefore religion, philosophy, etc., etc., are all useless. So let's just throw them out. No, <laughs> no. That's not it at all. But we see, for example, here in Tiruvannamalai, after Ramana Maharshi passed away, the immediate next generation of teachers became nihilists. And they said, there's no need for sadhana, there's no need for worship or puja or any other spiritual practice that just to know about Brahman is enough. No, that's, that's completely wrong. That leads nowhere. And we see most of their followers are going nowhere. They're living perfectly ordinary lives on a dualistic platform in the world, engaged in all kinds of the usual nonsense. And the only thing is then they, they put some title on themselves that, oh, now I'm an Adwaitan. No, you're not an Adwaitan. You're stuck in dualism. And they prove it by preaching their doctrine, which is called Neo-Advaita. Huh? Neo as actually means pseudo, <laughs> phony. Right? They preach their pseudo-Advaita as if it was a fundamentalist religion. And if you don't agree with them, they simply cancel you. They ghost you. Huh? They block you on Facebook, and that's it. Bye-bye. There's no discussion. That's fundamentalism. Just as much as fundamentalist Christians or Islamists or anybody. So what is the real understanding? The real understanding is, yes, Brahman, the absolute, the real truth is ineffable, inexplicable, inconceivable, etc. But these metaphors of religion, of spiritual paths, have a purpose and a place, and they have an effect. And you can get that effect, you can get the results, you can get the benefits by following them and using them as a map. See, what's the difference between fundamentalism 
And what I'm saying, fundamentalism says, this is my religion and it's the absolute truth and it's the only one and the best one <laughs> and it can never change. Whereas we're saying, no, treat these religious teachings as a metaphor, as a map, and then go exploring within. See what you find. That's a vast difference. It's the difference between being extroverted and being introverted, having your attention on the senses and having your attention on the consciousness, the mystery within. I was talking with a scientist last night, huh? a real bona fide scientist. <laughs> we were chatting online. And he had to admit that science has gone astray. Science used to be about discovering the ultimate truth. But now it has become about chasing research grants huh? and politics. It's degenerate, in other words. And, you know, just like most religions are degenerate, they're degenerate because they no longer actively explore within. And the same with science. Science is all about the world. Investigating and imitating nature. But the, and, and similarly with religion nowadays, it's all about doing prayers and ceremonies and maybe even charity work and stuff like that. It's all external. You know, well, that's a good place to start. But at some point, it has to shift gears and instead of being directed out toward the world, be directed inward toward the self. If that doesn't happen, then your religion or your science or whatever is degenerate. It's degenerate. Because we know the truth is not out there. Huh? The truth is in here. And the reason we know that is that when people actually follow the spiritual path, not as a dogma, not as a rigid set of beliefs, but as an adventure, as a search and exploration, they get results. So I got those results. I followed that path. Even for many years, I'll admit it, I was kind of dogmatic. But I wasn't so dogmatic that when I encountered evidence to the contrary, I couldn't change. See, once I encountered evidence that the predecessors of the spiritual path that I was following had done some unethical things, like lied about the Buddha, lied about uh, Shankaracharya, and so on, I bailed, I got out of it, I dropped it, and I went on a search for a more truthful, a more ethical spiritual path, and I found it. And I didn't find it so much out in the world or by reading books. I found it by going within and looking at my experience honestly, without any dogma, without any preconceptions, huh? just went within and watched as a witness and astounding things happened. So I wanna say that, you know, there's always two sides of a coin. So the one side that we talked about yesterday is that religions, philosophies, etc., are abstractions and metaphors. Okay, fine. But that doesn't mean we throw them out. Like Krishnamurti, really, I think in the West, started this trend of nihilism. And the neo Advaitins then continued it, especially after Ramana disappeared. The very next generation, and what, what to speak of the present generation, completely nihilistic, 
They don't follow any kind of sadhana or anything. But the other side of the coin is that when we use these spiritual teachings as maps, when we realize they are metaphors, they are abstractions, and that the reality they're abstracted from is our inner experience, then they are very, very helpful, very productive in terms of insight and spiritual advancement. So what is spiritual advancement? Huh? I was reading an interesting piece last night where the author said, the purpose of the sacred is to remind us of the mystery of the unknown. And the purpose of the profane is to make us forget. Isn't it? The whole mundane world of media, advertising, cities, civilization, material advancement, and so on and so forth, is totally aimed at making us forget the sacred, forget the mystery, forget the inexplicable that we are, and put our attention outside through the senses. See, if I look at something man-made, let's say a house, I happen to be sitting in a house right now, we know how it's made. Maybe we don't know all the details, but generally we know some people went out and dug some clay and baked it into bricks, and then some other people stacked up those bricks with some cement to glue it together, and then covered it with nice plaster so it looks beautiful, <laughs> and so on and so forth. They installed electricity and water and all this stuff. And now we have a house. There's no mystery in it at all. Huh? Maybe a slight bit like, I don't know exactly how the electricity is hooked up or the plumbing, but not, not really. We know that some man, some human came and did that work. But when we look at nature, when we look at a tree or a bird or even an insect, it's inexplicable. It's a mystery. And in truth, all these so-called wonderful technological advances are simply copied from nature. Scientists observed nature, and then they figured out how things were working, very superficially, of course, and they imitate. But all the principles, all the functions of modern science are discoveries in nature. So nature is the original author of everything. And when we look at a product of nature, it's inconceivable. How does a tiny seed grow into a huge tree? And look at it. All the leaves are similar, yet everyone is different. How, who figured this out? What kind of intelligence must there be to make this happen? See, this is a mystery. It can't be understood. And if you try, it will dry you out. Another quote I read in the same piece last night, Charles Darwin. Uh -huh. He's talking about, when I was a young man, I used to enjoy a beautiful sky, a, a broad landscape, uh, I used to be enamored of the beauties of nature in so many different ways. But now that I've spent my life abstracting and make, from my observations and making theories and trying to figure out how it all works, I have become dry, he says. I don't enjoy anything anymore. And part of that is probably old age. <laughs> But even me, at my age, I still enjoy everything. I still can laugh like a child. I still can feel wonder and joy at the mysteries of nature. Why? Because I accept that they're mysteries. I accept that they're inexplicable, ineffable, inconceivable, non-conceptual. 
And I can live with that. I'm okay with that. In fact, <laughs> I'm delighted. Because it means that we are in the arms of a greater power. There is something that creates us and enfolds us and protects us and makes us live and helps us to learn if we let it. And as I said last time, I prefer to use the metaphor of the Divine Mother because it's the most inclusive metaphor. It doesn't tell us to be austere and dry and intellectual and dogmatic and ceremonial and all that. It tells us to be childlike and fresh and to approach the world <laughs> and nature with a wide open mind uh, and a happy attitude of a child who knows that he's protected. And you might say, well, what do you mean protected? We all have to die. That's a part of nature too. Death can be beautiful. My sannyas guru, Jnana Shakti Swami, when he died, it was beautiful. There was no sadness. There was no mourning. Huh? I mean, some people got into all of that, but that wasn't, that wasn't our mood. He and I had a deep energetic connection. And when he left his body, I tracked him down. <laughs> I went into meditation and found him. It took a long time because he had gone very, very high. He's like a god now. He's in, in bliss. He's enjoying like everything. And he told me just a couple of days before he left his body, there is no pain. There's no sadness. He said, I'm glad I'm going to be going to Divine Mother. And finally, I want to remind you of a quote from the uh, novel by Hermann Hesse, Goldmund and uh, Narcissus. Narcissus und Goldmund is the name of the novel. Very interesting novel about two friends and one becomes a priest and a monk. And the other one is a playboy. And women love him and he has all these affairs. And finally, when he gets old, he joins his friend in the monastery and becomes a sculptor because he's had his hands on so many beautiful bodies. <laughs> he knows how to sculpt the statues in the church, in the cathedral. So finally, he gets old and he reaches his last days and he's lying on his deathbed. And his friend, the monk, comes to him and he says, aren't you afraid? You've lived your whole life chasing women. Now you have to go and meet God. And don't you repent? Don't you want to uh, atone for your sins, you know? Aren't you afraid of death? And he goes, no, no. Because I know the mother. How can you die without a mother? Those were his last words. And his friend, the monk Narcissus, spent the rest of his life contemplating them. So with that, I'll close. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.